Well, good evening, everyone. And welcome, welcome to the 92nd Street Y here in New York City. I am Stephanie Shriok, and I am the president of Emily's List. Thank you. Okay, for the rest of you who didn't clap, I'll let you know what Emily's List is. We are an organization solely dedicated to electing pro-choice Democratic women to office up and down the ballot across this country. That is our job. And I am just so thrilled to be here this evening with all of you. You are going to have just an extraordinary panel in just a moment. Uh, and I'm also very, very honored to be here to launch the first XYZ event, which is, I love this, I love this. X, XYZ was launched just last month uh, by the 92nd Street uh, Y as a free forward-looking membership group for members of generations X, Y, and Z. So as someone who is firmly planted in the middle of Gen X, I just want to thank you for letting us into something that's cool and hip, because <laughs> we're not very cool and hip, uh, and I feel really honored to even be considered part of the XYZ generation group. So thank you. Thank you on behalf of all the Gen Xers here. Uh, before I get started, I just want to make sure that you know that this is about your participation and your energy. So, ushers are gonna be coming down uh, through the theater here. They're gonna be handing out cards for your questions. Please start thinking about your questions uh, for these extraordinary people, uh, and the ushers will come through a couple times and pick those up. This is how this works. This isn't just about folks talking at you. It is about you, engagement, and making sure we are addressing the concerns, issues, thoughts that you have. So ushers will be up and down um, the aisle. I also want to do a shout out for one of the panelists who's a dear friend of mine, Cleo Wade, whose new book is outside. So you should go get one. Heart, tar heart, heart Talk um, is available and you can uh, get that in. And if you're lucky, she might sign it in the lounge later. Uh, so let me just talk real briefly here about what we see is going on across this country, particularly as it relates to the empowerment of women and women's voices. So as you know, women in fact make up more than 50% of the population. However, women still make up less than 20% of Congress. Yes less than 20% of Congress. Just in case you're wondering, that makes the United States at about 103rd in the world in the percentage of women in our federal offices. We're gonna change that in 2018. It is time. It is time. And to even make, make this matter worse, we need younger women and men to step up and run because millennials are only 2% of Congress. So if you're wondering why the policies that are coming out are so bad, it's because you're not there. So it's up to you to start making this change. You know, the only way we do get better policies for women and families in this country is by diversifying the voices and perspectives that serve in our governments. That is what we absolutely have to do. Have to do. And Emily's List you know, started because way back when, in 1985, was anybody born back in 1985? The Gen Xers were. <laughs> there hadn't been a single Democratic woman elected to the United States Senate in her own right. Now that was not 1885, it was 1985. Uh, and so we started uh, to really work to ensure that women were recruited, were, were supported, were given the resources to win and to fight uh, and to change this country. And it's work that we continue to do. Since then, we've helped to elect over 20 senators. We've helped to elect over 100 women to Congress. We've helped to elect well over 800 women to state and local office. None of those numbers are big enough. But at least it is the beginning of changing voices. And what we do at Emily's List is make sure 
as I said, that those women get the resources, not just financial, but staff and, so, and really sometimes emotional support. Because I'll tell you what, if you're running with, say, young children, my young sisters here who may have young children, and you get asked every day, so who's going to take care of your kids if you win? That's hard. And that's what happens. Or for a woman that we've got running for governor in Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, who has been asked on a number of occasions, are you going to run as a woman? <laughs> so we're not just financial support. We are the whole bucket of support that you need to get through your day sometimes as a woman candidate. Uh, the good news is that folks are standing up in ways we've never seen before. And since Election Day 2016, we have heard from, at Emily's List, over 36,000 women who want to run for office in this country. It is unprecedented. And they're not necessarily all running right now, but this is the next decades of leadership in this country. I'm hoping that some of you are in this room, our future candidates, our future members of Congress, our future senators, maybe a future president is in this room. That's what we need. That's why we have to keep pushing and encouraging each other to step up and get engaged. And these women right now, they're not waiting for the perfect time. They're not waiting for somebody to give them permission. They're sick of people telling them it's not your turn. They're taking it because time's up. Time's up. And we are seeing women of such diverse ages and professions, women like Gina Ortiz Jones, Abby Finkenauer, and Lauren Underwood, who are all young, energetic voices that are going to completely change the debates that we are having in Congress when they win in this November election. Others are running for local offices, they're running for mayors or city councils or school boards. We know that this wave of women that is coming in will truly change the culture in so many of our legislatures. And isn't it time to change some culture and maybe knock out some bad behavior that we've been seeing across the country in our government bodies? The women are coming in, and they're coming in because good women and men are backing them up. So with that, I hope that each and every one of you, including my brothers in the room, think about how you're serving. And if it's your time to think about running for office, at Emily's List, we have a rule. You can't tell me never. You can tell me not now, and I'll tolerate that. But don't tell me never, because there is so many places where we need voices of strong, smart, young women and men to step up and serve. Because if we're going to get policies that represent everybody, we need those voices at the table. You can even run, you know, everybody thinks, oh, i got to run for Congress. You can run for city council. You can run for neighborhood boards. You could run for your condo association. I know that sounds terrifying for a lot of us. <laughs> but I'll also tell you that former United States Senator Barbara Boxer of California started running for her condo association. So you never know where it's going to lead you. So please, please consider your next steps in the movement. And if you're not ready to run yet, I'm begging you, in 2018, with all that's going on, adopt a candidate. Adopt a candidate. Give some time, maybe a little bit of resources, uh, and I swear you will have an incredible, incredible uh, experience in the process. Um, so with that, thank you so much for having us here. Thank you for being here on a Friday night. This is an empowered group of folks who want to hear some really interesting topics. You're going to hear it. So with that, I want you to join me in welcoming Simone Sanders, Clea Wade, and Jason Kander to the stage. You're going to love these folks. And thank you so much. Thank you. Simone, Is this it's on? all yours. Thank you. Is this thing on? Can y'all give Stephanie Shriak a round of applause? And can somebody turn my mic up? You can do better than that. Give it up for Stephanie Shriak, okay, ladies and gentlemen. 
Y'all don't know, Emily's List is out here doing the Lord's work. If you believe in the Lord, if you don't believe in the Lord, they're out here doing the work of the universe. <laughs> we need them. So Google Emily's List if you haven't. Donate, sign up, give something to somebody, because we all, we all need to support some candidates. Uh, I am very excited to be here. We're at the 92 Y. We're having a young people conversation. The room is full. Are you excited? Yeah. OK. Well, um, I am here with some two very important people, some millennials. We found out backstage that Jason is like barely making the cut, but <laughs> we're going to let him stay on the panel Five tonight. Five months. Five months. Yeah. We'll take him. I'm just saying, he's barely here, y'all. I almost had to pull his millennial card, but <laughs> we'll work with it. Uh, I'm sitting here with artist, author, who we will talk about that book a little bit later, poet, and everybody's BFF, according to the New York Times. It's oh Cleo Wade. Y'all give it up for her. And to my far, far left, I am sitting here with the Barely Millennial, uh, former Secretary of State of Missouri, and one, somebody that has one of the most famous uh, campaign ads ever, and the president of Let America Vote, Mr. Jason Kander. Give it up for Jason Kander. All right. I have some questions here on my phone. And you know what? Forget these questions. We're tossing the questions out. I want to start here. We're talking about um, being the change you want to see in 2018. But what, what, what the hell is the change? When we talk about being the change, what are we actually talking about? What kind of change are we talking about wanting to see in the first place? What is change? I feel like people talk about be the change you want to see, go out there and change the world, but what kind of change are we talking about? You, I, I, I'll I'm go. like, <laughs> you can go, go ahead. All right. After Stephanie Shriark talks, the last thing I'm going to do is like jump in in front of a woman to talk. I mean, right? you did That's, jump though. Like yeah, you didn't you wait did. for her. I kind of said, "Okay, Would okay, you I'll like start. To? I'll yeah. start." Okay. Thank you. So, I, I, you know, I, I think that when we think about change now, it's really having the imagination to create new normals. I, I think that a lot of, um, you know, I was when I was at South by Southwest, someone asked me a question about, uh, I think it was something about how. Um, you know, when you're pushing for diversity or inclusivity, mm -hmm. um, how do you walk the line of that in tokenism? And I, um, I remember saying that I don't even really use the words inclusivity or diversity because I feel like I'm fighting within a structure that never wanted to include mm. people to begin with. And so even around that, I'm like, we need new language. We need to have the imagination for, for, for new ways to talk about things, new ways to talk about and reflect the people of our country and the world. And so I think for what's so crucial is that we, you know, have a radical imagination right now so that we can say, you know what, this is normal. Mm -hmm. These are the stories that must be told because these are the stories that are impactful. These are the stories that 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 matter. And and so to me I think change is is not fighting the old but having the imagination to innovate the new. Mm, innovate the new, changes. And that's a gem, y'all. We are tweeting. If you're going to tweet, hashtag <laughs> be the change. <laughs> Jason, what, give me your definition. What, what are we talking about when you talk about change? I feel like right now it is being able to feel like we're moving forward again okay. as a country. I mean, one of the, I think, best things that's been said about the period we're living through right now is actually on, on, on the day of inauguration, it was one of the last... Uh, it was that day, uh, President Obama, before he got on, on uh, Marine One to fly off after the inauguration, you know, he... Before he left us. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> he didn't leave us, but yeah. He broke yeah. my heart, I'm yeah. just going to say. Um, but, you know, he, he addressed a small group of people, and he said, elections are not periods, they're commas. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that just really resonated with me. And I feel like, you know, we're still, we're living in that comma right now. And so it's when we get to that point where we feel like, because I think during his eight years, you know, not all the time, but most of the time we felt like whether you agreed with everything or not, you felt like we were moving forward. Mm -hmm. You know, you had that sense as a country that we were moving forward. And I think that that's really what we want. We would just want to get back to moving forward again. And right now it, it doesn't feel that way at all. I mean, people would argue and I would agree that often we're moving backward. I mean, we're now battling the civil rights battles of the past again, but they're not really of the past. They're just still going on. Um, so I just think being able to wake up every day and be like the country is moving forward to feel that way would be the change that I'm looking for. Absolutely. I would, I would like that change. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people in the room can help create it. So I, I think activism is one of the ways nowadays that people think about change. Would you all agree? Yeah, absolutely. So Cleo, you talk a lot about activism and that folks should try to, try to do everyday acts of activism. 
what are some practical examples of everyday activism that folks in the room uh, and people who are watching via a live stream somewhere mm -hmm. can do? Well, I think it's important to not, um, to allow your activism to look however you need it to look. And even if that means not using the word, I think sometimes even the word activist is, is, it scares a lot of people and, and, and they feel like, well, what does that really mean? How do I do that if I'm not Gloria Steinem? And, and I do think that that can be intimidating. And so I feel like I, I, I am very careful about using the word activist um, because I don't know that it feels so easy to mm -hmm. be able to claim uh, for everyday people. And I usually use the term active citizen because I think we can all decide to do something active. So whether that is picking up a piece of garbage on your street or saying hi to your neighbor and asking how they're doing and really listening, all of those things are acts of community building, which is so necessary. And I think that sometimes we forget that very few of our actions are neutral. We really are either building or destroying where we come from, even if that means as I'm walking down the street, I'm on my phone the whole time. Yes, that may not be as destructive as like, you know, bashing my neighbor's window, but it's not building because I can't see who I'm around. I can't notice I can't notice the issues. I can't, I can't see the problems. I can't even see the things that could be giving me joy that day and, and feeding me and replenishing me during a time that is so exhausting. Uh, and so I think that it's so important to just remember that it looks however you need it to look, whether that's the dollar you give that day, whether that's the smile you give that day, whether that's the how are you you give that day. Um, those are all acts of building. Absolutely. Well, Jason, I feel like you have had a crash course in mm -hmm. active building and being yeah. an active citizen. Uh, you had no, you were running for something in 2016. Mm -hmm. You were sitting here, which makes me believe you did not win. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jason's my friend, so I can say this to him. You don't think I'd be here with you anyway? I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't. I, don't I would think be here with you anyway. Um, but you you didn't stop after you lost an election. Right. So I, I talk to me a little bit about why you decided to start an organization, uh, particularly an organization centered around voting, mm -hmm. uh, and how are you an active citizen and actively, we're using active today, mm -hmm. actively participating uh, in trying to help us be that and see the change we'd like to see in 2018? Well, first, I think it starts with just in, in general, like you talked about, you know, the fact that I kept going, I guess, it's just because, look. How'd you feel when you lost the election? Well, the thing is, is I didn't feel that different from anybody in the room because I'm still, you know, a citizen of the country that Donald Trump had just won the presidency of. So, <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I had lost a race that day by a really thin margin, but, like, Donald Trump was going to be president. So, like, there was Back. bigger stuff going on, you know? <laughs> and, and I was not happy about it. And, and I recognized that, look, I, I feel like part of... Uh, you know, part of really caring about this country is you have to care about the politics of the country and the direction of the country, not just when you're winning. And not, not like me personally, but like, you know, the progressive side, not just when you're winning. It's, it ain't a fair weather fandom. It's, in fact, I would argue you have to care more and put more energy into it when you have not won, because that's when you're needed the most. And so that's where my head was. And then, you know, I was Secretary of State in Missouri, so I had been a chief election official in a state with a, with a GOP supermajority in the legislature. I had seen voter suppression up close and personal. I knew how the playbook worked. And then I saw a President of the United States saying that there were three to five million illegal voters in the election, which is not true. And then I, I argue that's the biggest lie a sitting president's ever told, but I haven't checked Twitter in the last 10 minutes since we got out here, so. <laughs> perhaps, Are you sure there's more? Perhaps yeah. <laughs> cha it's changed, but you know, so that was just about undermining faith in democracy so that he could make sure that there were laws all over the country that make it harder to vote. Um, and particularly for people who weren't gonna vote for him. And given my experience, I just knew like, well, I can make a difference here. And so we started an organization to make it harder to get reelected for folks who do that. And uh, that's what Let America Vote is. And so, but for me, activism, I think it's, it's a mental health thing, honestly. In many ways, it's selfish. Mm. I mean, if, for the folks here, if you have had a conversation like on a weekly basis that is basically, uh, you know, how long do you think this guy's gonna actually last in office? If that's what you're doing, then every day when you wake up and you check and he's still president, it's November 9th, 2016 all over again. Like, you don't put yourself through that. So when I say mental health, I mean, every day that I'm able to get up and fight back, personally, I, that's necessary for my mental health. And I think it's true for everybody here to, to do something active every single day. Absolutely. Yeah.
Well, I mean, I got a follow-up question now. Yeah. So if you all about the fight and the mental health of the fight, does this mean, like, uh, it's some crazy stuff going on in Missouri with your current <laughs> governor right now. So uh, are, are you running for governor? I'm not, no. Are you sure? I'm sure I'm not okay. running for governor. Yeah, are you I'm sure. positive? I'm positive I'm not running Would for governor. Would you consider it? No. And um. I want you, and I want you to tell people why. Why would you not want to run for governor? Is it because well, what you running for president? <laughs> <laughs> Came here to break a little news tonight at the 92. Why? Okay. So I'm gonna go with your original question. Why am I not running for governor? I'll circle back in six months for the second one. Go um, ahead. Look. I feel like what I'm doing right now is really important, and and I feel like I'm I'm making a difference with what I'm doing. I want to keep doing it. There are going to be great people in in 2020 who run for governor in Missouri. I'm gonna I'm gonna help them, um, and I think that there'll be a Democratic governor. Then it won't be me, but uh, I'm I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm gonna keep doing it. The press secretary in me loves that answer. Y'all give him a round of applause. <laughs> 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 That's a high compliment. I'll take that. I it, uh, literally, I love yeah. it. Okay, so I, we I just want those socks. We can. The socks are lit. The socks are lit. Let America vote has say, socks, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. That's a uh, you. Support the movement. You're now, you're now going to be like all over the website. I just want those socks. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Why do you think people think change is so hard? <laughs> I mean, you wrote a whole book about. Uh, <laughs> how I'd like to describe it is like existing healthy in this world. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how I like to describe the book that you wrote and the, and the work that you do. And so all, all of the work that you do, I feel like, well, I look at Cleo Wade, I look at Cleo's Instagram, and I'm like, this, this, this will help me live a healthier life, <laughs> mentally and spiritually, maybe not physically, because she's backstage eating cupcakes. Yeah. <laughs> but so why do you think, though, and I mean, I think change and activism is an important part of what you talk about, but why do you think people view change as so difficult, just the concept of change? You hear change, people are like, oh, I don't know. Why? You know, I think a lot of the time we let our inability to do everything get in, our, in the way of our ability to do something. So sometimes I think we're looking at the, the biggest change we want to make or the, the, f the furthest point from where we are. And we decide that we're so overwhelmed, we kind of throw up our hands instead of pull up our sleeves. And so in that, I think that the easiest way to think about change is what can I do today? What can I do in this moment? Mm -hmm. How could I help this? Um, not how can I completely dismantle that, or, or I think also we think of just how much history and systems and structures exist um, behind all the things we do want to change, so that gets really overwhelming because we have something that may have existed for a hundred years that we're trying, that we want to see end in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the easiest way to think about how you affect change in your lifetime is thinking about, okay, what do I do tomorrow? Um, what do I do the next day? And sometimes I even think thinking about the issues that you know you can see end in your lifetime. I think something like mass incarceration is something that we mm -hmm. really can see, we really could end in our lifetime. So there's certain things that that gives me so much hope and, and that really makes me want to get to work on, on, on certain issues like issues that. Issues like that. So follow-up question to start with you and then Jason, I want you to jump in here. Now how can we ensure, there's been lots of movements that have um, popped up, if you will, over the last, I mean, over the last year, but definitely over the last, I would say, 10 years even. Um, like the Me Too movement mm -hmm. and Time's Up, um, the Black Lives Matter movement. So how can we ensure uh, that these movements are a part of making real, lasting change? I think that we have to make sure that we look at the online place as not the answer, but the starting point. Mm. So living beyond the click is crucial. No, no hashtag activists out here. Right. Hashtag <laughs> activists. Hashtag okay. activists, yeah. So I think that, you know, m micro connections are made so well online. So I can, you know, when we were backstage, I was like, I stalk you online just so you know. <laughs> But you can't have the, the macro connections are best made offline. Right. And, and really being able to be together and say, okay, well actually I'm gonna be in DC that next week, so if you wanna be able to da 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 da, that's how we, that's where we can really organize in an incredibly impactful way. So I think that when we now, you know, it's said that every time a new language is introduced, there, the, we're in chaos. And I think that now we are kind of understanding the chaos that the language of the internet has brought to us. Mm -hmm. And we can start seeing that it's not about either or, but it's about how we balance the two. So to make the micro connections online and then make macro change and macro impact offline, 
I think figuring out how that works for you in your life is, is critical. Absolutely. So Jason, same question. I mean, I would also add, how can we ensure uh, that in this point in time in history, in our, in our political history, that the work that we're doing right now uh, translates into real change? I think it's a couple of things. So like on the first part, you know, with the, with the different movements out there, part of it is about recognizing the common goals between them, right? Like you mentioned Black Lives Matter and you mentioned Me Too. We tend to think about this and we tend to think about issues as very separate. That's how we talk about them, mm -hmm. right? Like, but nobody experiences issues one at a time. Like in real life, nobody Absolutely. does. And so, you know, when you, when you talk about those in particular, it's like, look, they're all really about safety. They're about having communities where people feel safe. Um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, I always point out to, I'm, I've spent a lot of time in Ferguson being from Missouri, and I always point out to folks, there's nobody that I met there who's like, I don't want the police in my community. No, that movement was about, I want the police to be in my community and be effective and be able to protect my community. I wanna have a positive relationship, right? That it was, in, in many ways, it's a pro good law enforcement movement. That's really what it is. And then the Me Too movement, it's not like, it's not anti-man, right? It's no. about, it's about making, there's an, making sure there's an equitable relationship there, that, that, that it works the way it really should and that's just. And that, you know, that's just two things right there that they have in common. And what it all comes back to is like, people feeling safe, people feeling respected, um, and every American feeling that way, including people who wouldn't be included in those movements. That's really universal. And then the other part of it, like how do we stay motivated about it? How do we keep working toward it? I think that particularly political activism or, or you know, seeking progress, it takes like a mix of patience and impatience. And this is really, I think what you were, uh, I think you nailed this, which is that that ability to wake up every day and work toward it mm -hmm. while knowing that it's not necessarily gonna happen today. Um, but still working so ha working as hard as you would if you think it can happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then like for those in elected office or working with those in elected office, it's recognizing it may not happen while you're in office and it may not happen while you're alive and that in no way absolves you of the responsibility to you know, move the baton to the next person. We gotta do the work. Yeah. So again, Jason is a barely millennial, but we'll, we'll, we'll work, we'll, we'll roll with Five it. Five months, today. they keep moving the year on me, you know? <laughs> okay, we, he keeps saying they moved the year. We've never heard about the year. I've never was, heard about the year. It was movement. 80 and then it was 81. I was born in May of 81. I think by next year, they're gonna be like, you're out, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to let you keep your card who gets, for today. Who's in charge of moving it, by the way? I don't know, but maybe that's what we need to organize, right? Yeah. That's, some, that's some change I, I want to see. <laughs> um, so because we're all millennials here, some of us more than others, <laughs> I, I, want you to I want you to talk about a time, uh, because it means we all get, we, we got engaged and involved at fairly young ages for all of us. Um, talk about how on your quest to create change, on your quest to, I don't think we necessarily woke up in the morning and was like, I'm gonna change the world, but maybe you did. But on your quest to do the thing it is that you were doing, um, I'm sure each of you have encountered like roadblocks. People that tell, told you you couldn't do that. So tell me about in time where you encountered a significant roadblock in, on your quest to change and how you worked through that. Because I think that's important for people to know because we always talk about, be the change you want to see in the world, create the change. And then no one tells you that uh, change means you run up into a brick wall maybe five, six, eight times over a period of two years. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Change ain't easy, y'all, yeah. but it's necessary. Um, I mean, I feel like I hit a roadblock every single day, every time I hear a story about a young black boy who asks for directions and gets shot at. I think every time I hear about a young black man who's getting shot in his grandmother's backyard, um, I think there's not a roadblock I don't feel every day that breaks my heart. And the work I do is make sure that I take the time and, and to mend it the best I can so that I can keep going and make sure that when I do use my platform to speak on the things that are important to me, um, and defy these roadblocks that I'm doing it from, you know, a healed place because there's, you know, the old saying is like healed people, heal people, hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm. And that I'm not energetically dumping into um, the world. Instead, I'm, I'm trying to create messaging that inspires us to, to keep doing the work despite the everyday roadblocks. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Look, I think for me, like a, a particular instance, I'm sure there's several, but I, you know, when I first started running for office, I was, um, uh, I mean, I was not much younger actually than you are now, but whatever. 
Um, but I'm I was, 28. For yeah, everyone. I was 26 when I started running, and people uh, initially they were, there was a lot of skepticism about that. But what was interesting for me, and look, I think it, I don't think I, it's pretty clear. Like of the three up here, probably I've experienced the least adversity. I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? So look at that awareness of the privilege. Yeah. <laughs> look, I mean. Jason <laughs> Cannon for president, everybody. Uh, we both turned into Raji. We're just like, <laughs> you're doing great, sweetie. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it felt that I was feeling that, yeah. Um, so, no, I mean, like, for me, it was, it was very minor stuff, right? Like, at the beginning, it, there was just skepticism about the idea of a, of a guy that age running. But what's interesting, and I think this is probably relatively universally true from an age perspective, is that, like, when I started running for state representative in Kansas City back in, in 07, 08 election, I would go to a door and like somebody who was maybe, they looked like they were over 60, they'd come to the door. And at first I, I would, I'd be very trepidatious about it because of what people had said to me. And I found that as you went up the generational spectrum, people were more excited to see somebody young at their door running for office. And, and that was exciting to me. And it's been that way. This is the oldest I've ever been. And so as a result, <laughs> like at, at every level. Thank I've, you for that clarification. Yeah. We were wondering. You know, I'm not great at math, but that I got. <laughs> but and so I've just experienced that at each level, at least from an age perspective, um, it's been, I've found mostly it's been welcomed. But again, like, I'm a white man ex saying that, so I know that that's not a universal experience. Facts, so, let, I mean, let's talk about that. Let's talk about, because again, people talk about change. I think sometimes we talk about change as this big grandiose concept, but we always say, you know, everybody can change, everybody can go out and create change. But there are, I think you bring up a, a very valid and important point. There are barriers for various people when it comes to uh, engaging in whether we want to call it activism, active citizenship, when it comes to uh, creating and moving and being an innovator uh, in our society. And so how can we Help each other. One, how can we speak more plainly about that? Because that is not a conversation we mm -hmm. usually are having in the main, in a mainstream conversation. But two, how can we help each other along with that? Like how we talk about how these movements are intersectional, but you know, people would have you believe that the Parkland kids were the first kids to organize around gun violence in their community. Right. When the Parkland young people are the first people to tell you that we stand on the shoulders of young folks in the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so let, let's talk about that. I think they're a great example of how to do that. I mean, I, when, I, I, the fact that they have made sure to reach out, I mean, and they have outright said, look, we recognize there's a reason that we've gotten attention and, 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 that, uh, and that that's the reason. And they said, so we're going to use that to make sure we lift other people up. And so I, I, think, I think that's it. I think progress, when you've, when you've had some success, you have a responsibility not to pull the ladder up behind you, but to find other ladders and lower them down. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that if you are so fortunate as to have been, you know, born at the top of the ladder or to, you know, have happened upon the ladder, I just think no matter who you are, you have that responsibility. And that really, that, whether that's the case is sort of one of the defining arguments in our politics, right? As to whether there's some weakness in, in lowering another ladder, like there's a weakness to caring about people that you may not know. Which is crazy. And yeah, and I don't think that there is. I, I think that's a really positive character trait, actually. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think... You know, the old Gloria Steinem line of um, the issues are linked and not ranked is, is more clear yeah. than ever. And, and what I've really enjoyed seeing is the way that people, you know, are using the way they give information um, to be, um, to tell the full, the full story. So, for example, you know, we have the gender pay gap day mm -hmm. on, online every year. And I've watched it over the past three years go from only saying the percentage of white women to white males to... I didn't see a single one this year Absolutely. not break it down completely. And so I think that even how we're giving and sharing information, we're making sure that the, our stories aren't coming from a single space. And I think that if we can action that into also how we live, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, look at your group of friends, mm -hmm. look at the tables you sit at in a meeting, ask yourself, like, do we all look the same? Are these stories all the same? Actively diversify your life. You know, and, and I think that, that those two words together are a lot stronger than um, we need diversity. I'm like actively diversify your life, live an anti-racist life. Uh, I think that that's, uh, that's the word, that's the language we need now more than, oh, 
they're not that racist or, oh, I'm not racist. I'm like, well, are you anti-racist? Do you live a life where you wake up every single day and, yeah. and make decisions and talk to people in a way that actively builds, that, that take, takes down that system, those systems? Facts. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, facts. Yeah. You know, people, <laughs> look, people are out here living racist adjacent, sexist adjacent, mm. ableism adjacent every single day. And I think we should absolutely, if we're talking about being the change we want to see in 2018, challenge folks uh, on that point every single chance we get. So thank you for that point. Okay, I want to ask. <laughs> I had three shots of espresso, so pardon me. <laughs> she's like so good at this. I'm very excited. Oh, yeah, she's so good at this. You know, like, yeah. I'm like, she needs a podcast, right? I do need yes. a podcast. I'm going to get a podcast. podcast. I'm going to get a podcast. Yes, podcast, podcast. I'm, <laughs> I'm only going to let women come on my podcast, and Jason Cannon can come on if he decides to run for president. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way he's getting on my podcast, damn it. OK, so I have to ask, so who or what inspires you? Don't tell me. Don't, don't give me a platitude. I really okay. want to know what inspires y'all. Music. <laughs> <laughs> the birds. Is that a platitude? Nature. You know, the clouds, and they do that special thing. Um, the people in this room. Yeah, <laughs> you. Uh, I'll go. Uh, OK. Um, I've been in, since Trump took office, I've been in 39 states uh, doing events, talking uh, at different That's a events. lot of states. I want people to know you have kids. I have, yeah, I have a son who's four and a half. And you have uh, a you son told us behind, uh, he, behind, backstage, that he rerouted his flight this morning so he could bring his son to school. Yeah, and he flew from South Carolina, like three places to get to Kansas. He lives in Kansas City. Yeah, yeah. This is in the middle of the map, so. Yeah, it is. It's near <laughs> Omaha. Near <laughs> Omaha. Come that's on, right. go Big Red. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, I forgot the question. I don't know. <laughs> who inspires oh, oh, you? Who inspires just, me? We just thought it was okay. cool to yeah. note that like you went through all, like. Oh, I appreciate I'm it. I'm jumping that's through hoops thing. to go home so I can, don't have, so I can like get my lashes done. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to see a whole human, so. <laughs> better person than me. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, I was saying I've, I've been in, in these 39 states. I've been all over the place. And I think what, well, we can kind of see everybody. I'll, let me do this. Raise your hand if you personally know someone, or maybe this describes you, who has really gotten involved politically for the first time in their lives since Trump took office. Oh, okay, wow. That's what inspires me. Yes. Yeah. That's what it is, is that everywhere I go, I meet folks who, who that's their story. And, it, and, it, and what it reminds me of is like when we were talking earlier about the things that can discourage you. Clearly, if you look at, at what happens in the news, if you look at what comes out of Washington, for instance, it can be discouraging. But what inspires me is I see that everywhere I go, and it, hel it helps me remember that while they have the power, we have the momentum, and we just mm. have to keep going mm. forward. Mm. That's a word. <laughs> I'm here for it. Uh, I'm a side note, I'm a fellow at Harvard this semester, and <laughs> one time I, I was in a class and everybody just started going like this, <laughs> and I had to lean over, I said, why are people snapping? Yeah. <laughs> and they said, oh, it's less disruptive than the claps. I said, that's the bougiest thing yeah. I ever heard, but I'm here for it. <laughs> so if y'all don't ever want to be disruptive, you're just like, yes. <laughs> just thought I'd leave that gym with the audience. <laughs> so who or what inspires you, Cleo? <laughs> Let's just have a test run. Yes. So yeah, you're right. It's I'm not here as good. for it. Yeah. It's, Thank you. It's soothing, actually. It's super soothing. It's like <laughs> I'm gonna ask my eyelash lady to snap while she's doing my lashes. <laughs> as I'm laying on the table with the tape on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you guys photos. Okay, great. We're, we're definitely starting a group chat after this. <laughs> um, you know, I am, I'm, I'm really inspired by um, the emotions of people. I think that our emotions are really s such a thing that we all share as far as what motivates us. Mm -hmm. And so while, you know, whether you disagree with something, whether you um, are on either side of the political aisle, whether wherever you're from, emotions like fear or anxiety or sadness, they still motivate why you make the decisions you make. And so sometimes I think that we focus so much on 
how can these people make the decisions they make or, or vice versa, we have nothing in common because of the decisions we make, but if we went to the layer of what emotions cause us to make those decisions, we find that our emotions actually are identical, Wow. while our decision making mm. obviously leads us in opposite directions. And so for me, in my work, um, being a, you know, really having a, um, a practice of compassionate listening is, has been everything because you really can't write about emotions or the emotional experience of people well if you don't know how to really listen to them and be prepared to, to see them. And I, and I do think that there's a lot of healing we can do together from that space. Oh my God, our emotions are the same. Mm -hmm. That's, that, that seems so simple, but it's such a revolutionary Because sadness concept. is sadness. It's sadness. Anger is anger. Fear is fear. Mm -hmm. those, if those were colors, they'd be the same colors. Do mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And they just fuel us this way or that way. You know, the person who's pro-guns and the person who's anti-guns, they're still having the same emotional experiences. They're just fueling yeah, great different point. decisions. I better come on with Professor Cleo Wade in here <laughs> yeah. today. So on that note, Cleo, why do your, your poetry is really striking a chord with a lot of different people. Why do you think that is? You know, I think that it's because I write from that place. I, I, I really don't, um, I'm very, very careful to make sure that I allow there to be as much space in the writing as possible so that people can do what they need to do with it, not what I want them to do with it. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, you're an actual artist. I like, to, I like to say I'm not an artist, I just like to hang out with them because <laughs> artists are just on a, on a whole nother level. Okay, we have some crowd questions. Give claps for everybody in the room that wrote a question. Yes. Oh, I'm giving the first question to a young, young person in the audience. It says, I am a high school junior. I helped organize my high school walkout for gun control. Claps. Yes. And then I worked with my congressman to organize a student-run rally for gun control. Since then, though, interest has quickly dropped. Engaged activists, quote unquote, are once again disengaged. I'm at a loss. How do we keep issues and activism alive till November and beyond? Oh. Mm. Well, first of all, can I, I'm about to take some liberties as a moderator. <laughs> I would like to know that uh, DB, that's how they signed it, DB. DB, oh wherever God. you are, like we want to hug you. We want to hug you, one. And you are just you're an important part of this process. And so you being engaged and involved and fired up and asking these critical questions, I believe is critical to the pipeline of activism, active citizenship, or whatever to continue to go. We everybody, we need the one person that's laser focused on making sure this is a thing. But what kind of advice can we give to DB today? You um, start. Okay, um, a couple of things I think. <laughs> One, I always say, whatever your reason is, kind of going back to what you're saying about emotions, like whatever your reason is, and it's probably based in experience. It's not based in like an article you read. It's based in, in the experience you had in your life. Whatever it is that made you passionate about, in this case, uh, you know, gun reform, that's the most important thing you can say to other people to try to activate them. You have to take them on your journey with you. You have to let them feel the same thing that got you lit up. Uh, that's that's the first thing and the second thing is give people concrete stuff to do like it, it shameless plug for let America vote and internships <laughs> and the socks and the socks and the <laughs> you can you know we that's what we do with with our internships and with our volunteer opportunities uh, all around the country is you know at some point people get tired for instance of being asked to call their member of Congress six days a week right like they understand that that's important but at some point they you know a few months ago everybody went my member of Congress knows what I think about this. What else can I do here? And, and so that's, a, so if you're interested, you could text intern to 44939. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, but the, at the heart of what we're doing at Let America Vote and what a lot of other movements are doing is giving people concrete stuff to do. Going back to that, to that thing about mental health, knowing that you did something positive. So deliver them an opportunity to actually do something, harness their energy in a real way, and tell them why it is you care so much about it, and let them sort of live through that through your experience. Love it. Shout out to DB. Give DB yeah. Yeah. snaps or claps, whatever you're passing yeah. out today. <laughs> and, and I think continue telling the story, you know, and, and, and be and, and engage people in the sense of saying, you didn't think we were going to fix this in two weeks, did you? And, and, and also, it's, I think it's so important to always call the facts of how long people have been working against this so that they understand how much harder and how much longer it's gonna take for us to work 
for what, what needs to happen. Um, and that it wasn't a story that happened, it's a continuation, it's a, there was no period or exclamation point after Parkland, it dot, dot, dot. Absolutely, and, well, and ellipses. Can, well, let me add on this, specifically on this issue, we should all remember, we are winning the argument on this issue. Just because Congress hasn't acted, don't mistake that for us losing the argument. Congress hasn't acted because- The Florida State Legislature right. did. When everyone said they'd, they'd right. never pass any type of meaningful gun reform. Exactly. and. And all over the country, stuff's happening. Um, I, I interviewed at one point uh, Shannon Watts, who, who started Moms Demand Action, who's an amazing person. And, and she said something to me that really stuck with me. She said, she said, you know, this is the kind of issue where the battle does not start in Congress, it mm -hmm. ends there. And that is 100% right. Like, yeah, it'll take time, but we are winning the argument on this every single day, overwhelmingly with the American people. Yes, there are a group of people in Congress right now who lead Congress, who are failing to make the moral choice to put uh, you know, people's lives ahead of their own job security, but they're not there forever and we got a chance to replace them. Real they soon. might not be there this November. That's right, yeah. <laughs> okay, I love this question and at least it, it's in here two different times, so we have to, we have to ask it. <laughs> in the era of Trump, do you believe when they go low, we go high? It's still a viable campaign strategy. <laughs> I like to say nowadays, when they go low, we get in the gutter. Okay, but <laughs> I know I'm not everybody. <laughs> so one, I don't, I don't think it was ever a viable campaign strategy. Um, but it was, a, it was, it's a, it's a good rallying cry. Because I think, I think, I think the premise of that. Shout out to my forever first lady, Michelle Obama. Yeah. I think the premise of when they go low, we go high is to remember that we don't have to sink to the level of of bullies, of just other people that are not doing what they should be doing. And that we can keep it highbrow, we can keep it positive. Um, but what do y'all think about that? I, I think that you, we should- You gonna get in the gutter, Cleo? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I, I think, A, it's important to be authentic. I think that Authenticity is everything. I think you can't tell a good story, and stories are usually what change hearts and minds and then laws. Mm -hmm. And so I think you can't tell those stories without being authentic and telling that from an authentic place. I think we have to make sure that we're defining what high and low means. Exactly. You know, it doesn't mean that, um, okay, so I'm just gonna ignore what's happening and focus on something else that's good and say this. I think that you can, you can have a critique, you can have conversations where you disagree and stand for what you stand for and that is that is going high and I think that it's important to remember that you know you still have to be in your own life and walk in your own shoes and it's important to make decisions that make you feel proud every time you take a step in those shoes mm. and so I would never just want to walk around being a person that I wouldn't um, feel proud to be or a person that I wouldn't want to be able to be um, on a stage in front of 200 young girls and and so to me, I think about that more in the sense of, you know, we need to also be role models mm -hmm. because, you know, the change we want to see, yes, is in this room, but it's definitely in the room of the Lower East Side Girls Club in, in downtown. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, to me, I mean, yes, I think it's still the way to go, and here's what it means to me. It means we don't have a lot of work to do to convince people that the president is not a particularly good guy. We need, to, we need to remember that, right? 54% <laughs> so of the folks who voted voted for somebody not named Donald Trump, and he ha they haven't exactly like turned around on him since, <laughs> right? Like, he's not a guy you want to have house sit for you, and the country mostly <laughs> agrees. So we don't, have to, like, we don't have to belabor that. What we have to do, and to me, what in this case, going high is, is look, people want to know uh, what the other side wants to do for the country. So, so to me, that's going high. It's talking about the fact that what we're, and I'm a Democrat, so what we're trying to do is Democrat, I'm sure it's a really bipartisan room and everything, but. Uh, <laughs> is, I think I saw one of my Republican friends in the lobby. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, anyway, is, you know, I, I think that largely what we're about is making it so that um, every American hometown is a place where you can find success without having to leave if you don't want to. Mm. And, and that's not about Trump. That's about what, what I want to do in the country. And to me, that's going high, talking about what our vision is. Mm, I love it. I, to be clear, I try to go high every day. <laughs> but sometimes. Sometimes the press secretary in you. Sometimes <laughs> the press secretary in me requires that I get in the gut. Yeah. What's that Kanye lyric that's like, woke up and optimist. I can't believe I'm singing it. I'm so tender. <laughs> um, 
Do you know that letter? I don't, you know what? I know it. Believe it or not, the guy yeah, who's in five months you, morning. You I, know, I know it. it. Oh. I'm not gonna sing it. But you but, know yeah, the lyrics. I know it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, does it apply here? Yeah. Well, I'm look, she's the it. poet. I'm not gonna. <laughs> no, no, no. She's totally off. No, of course it's right. Yeah, she's the artist. Yeah, yeah. Of course it's right. I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're all on the same page. And side note about Kanye. Never mind. Not gonna. <laughs> we won't go there. We won't go Are there. Any of this questions? One of his tweets. Um, yeah, <laughs> none of the questions are about Kanye's tweets, but if I can note that when Kanye was talking about being, like, don't, don't let somebody turn you into being inauthentic the other day, I was just like, then what were you doing at Trump Tower when he right. should not be named? <laughs> you can't be out here lecturing us about authenticity and not selling your soul to the devil when you was all up in the lobby. With but, the devil. <laughs> with the devil. <laughs> It's from the four or five seconds song. Yeah, right? it is. Okay. It is. It's it took it me a second. It's yeah. from the four, I was sitting here thinking about it. It's from the four or yeah. five second song. Okay. Is that on your like? Do you have it on a playlist? Like that's. that's you can't get it on. Well, anyway. Well. <laughs> it's on. Yeah. No, you got Jason Candor. I haven't paid podcast. the money to for the whole subscription. To okay. Get. It's like a special prime yeah, thing. Yeah. Oh. I like that song though. Are you holding it's, out on the? It's it's uh, Rihanna. You run and, a nonprofit. Uh, Rihanna, it's okay. Paul McCartney. It's okay. <laughs> you run a nonprofit. I understand. And I don't take a salary. So. Uh, can you someone share their salary. password with him like so you can get a Spotify account? Might as well. <laughs> we now, don't pass now the money here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now that I did this public You're going to take up a donation for Jason Candor's Spotify. <laughs> You want title while we're at it? I'm doing, I'm doing fine, but after this, I do feel obligated to go on iTunes and download it. I do think I'm going to have to pay the $1.99 or whatever. Changing hearts and minds already, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Be the change you want to see in 2018. So there's a question in here. Where did it go? OK, so I think this is interesting, and I want us to talk about this. So the question is, is it possible slash can you change, underscore, a Trump voter's perspective? So let me give you all my premise, and you can just refute me or agree, and then tell me why. So I, I think this is an interesting question. And uh, I, I think I've only said this a couple times, but I'll say it here. You know, my father, God rest his soul, voted for Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> my father was a 64-year-old black man from Mound Bayou, Mississippi. Uh, and he voted for Donald Trump. And he kept talking about he was going to do it before it happened. And I was like, Daddy, job security. I need you to vote for Hillary. Mm -hmm. But also, like. <laughs> Literally, that's the first thing I said. <laughs> but also, like, why would you vote for Donald Trump? And so when people, um, I think when folks talk about Trump voters, um, they, they have one idea of a person that they think voted for Donald Trump. So in this question about can you change a Trump voter's perspective, I actually believe those are the wrong, that's, that's not the exact question we should be asking. We, I think we need to get back to a place of understanding. Um, and so many, so many times we engage in conversations, I do it on cable news all the time. Uh, about getting my point out and the other person getting their point out. And at no point in time are you going to change what I think about telling me, like, my conservative friends aren't going to change, like, what I believe. But they can bring me to a place of understanding about why they believe what they believe. And then maybe we can move forward in another place together. So I actually believe, I don't, I, Maybe it is possible to change a Trump voter's perspective, but I don't think that should be the goal. I think the goal should be to understand the perspective that they have. What do y'all think? Well, okay, so I got... You know some Trump voters? Yeah, like, I got, got 220,000 votes from folks who also voted for Donald Trump, even though the only thing we have in common is a fear of sharks, I'm pretty sure. So, <laughs> like, so here, here's... Here, like, I think perspective is exactly the right way, and the way you're, you're approaching it is, is exactly right. Because what I remind people of all the time is that I, I talked to a lot of those folks during the election. I've talked to them a lot since. A lot of them are friends of mine. It's not like people were, OK, here's how people approach it. They said, all right, I don't like this guy. Mm -hmm. They said, and this is not all of them, but the persuadable folks, which is a lot. They said, I don't like this guy. I don't like the way he treats people. And then they said, but it's made him very personally successful. And they said, and, if, and this is really the deal he made with voters. They said, if he's willing to do that for the country and therefore for me, they didn't say, like, that's awesome. But a lot of them said, I'm willing to give that a try. And so what's happened since is a lot of people are saying, and this is, I think, the right way to introduce the idea with people, a lot of people are saying, you know, I still don't like the guy. I still don't like the way he treats people. And he never made that transition. Everything that he's passionate about is still him. Mm. He never went from being the leader of the Trump organization to being the president of the United States. Everything is about him. And that, I think, is going to be his biggest problem going forward. And it's why it's such an opportunity for us to talk about what we want to do different. Absolutely. Clear. So I'm from Louisiana, and my stepfather voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And he's still my stepfather. <laughs> and 
Uh, and that's an important fact because yes, I know some people that yeah. have really ended yeah. friendships and relationships yeah. over 2016. And I really specifically didn't want to have, I didn't want to go home to my parents' house and feel like we're there, just some things we don't talk about mm. because that doesn't feel authentic to me. And so, but what I really noticed because he is the Fox News watcher. I mean, he watches it every morning and everyone he works with watches it. And My dad and used to watch Fox News and he was sending me articles from Breitbart like, <laughs> four years ago. <laughs> I Googled through my email and I was like, oh, the writing was on the wall. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I realized though is that the, the way that a lot of our news are talking about things is that they really push people more as um, brands and symbols. Mm. So I feel more like he was rooting for a team than rooting for issues. And so we created a rule where we don't talk about people, we only talk about policy. And so for the past year we had this, you know, we'd never talk about which senator was doing what or which person or, or what Donald Trump was doing. We'd talk about, oh, don't you think that it's so amazing that they're reforming bail here that, oh, if marijuana is going to be legal here, shouldn't we get all of, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people out of jail who have been sitting there? And don't you think that they should have all their rights back and be able to participate in that mm -hmm. industry? And so we'd only talk about the issues. And by the mayoral election in New Orleans, he voted Democrat. Really? And so, and I was so, and it was one of those things where he also could have opted out. He could have just been, you know, and I, and I honestly think that he might have even been a, a person who had never voted until Donald Trump. Like, I think that he was just, mm -hmm. he never, he was a person who was never engaged. And I find that talking policy over people, especially now, is so effective. Um, and I've had that experience where I've sat on a plane next to a guy who was probably couldn't have been more on the opposite side of the spectrum, but we were able to find middle ground by just talking about, I mean, we had this conversation about gun control, this, and this guy was honestly a nightmare. <laughs> Like when I sat down, I was like, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, what you like, doing? I was just like, this is a test. And it was so funny because it was the plane I was getting on to go give my TED talk about being able to love people who are just like <laughs> different than you. And so I was like, I know this is a test. <laughs> and he was, he was, he said to me on the flight, um, he's like, oh, people who don't want guns. He's like, I've got 300 of them. And I was like, <laughs> And he said, uh, and, and I said, well, what do you, and he's like, yeah, I've got a camp. And he's like, my family's collected them for years. I got some of the finest guns and did that. And I was like, and I was like, well, yeah, but what do you, like, you think that just, I was like, and I kind of like said to him, I was like, I said, well, you know, you seem pretty sane. But in my heart, I was like, I don't know if that's that sane. But, <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, you seem pretty sane. I think if you're sane, if you, you want to collect guns or have a camp or, or be, have a sport, um, then you should. And, Sure. And I was like, but you know, is there a gun in your car? And he's like, hell no. I never have a gun in my car. And he's like, and there's only one gun in my house. And it's in this one room that my wife knows where it is. And the, the, the thing is, is that if, um, if anyone ever broke into our house, she knows that it, it is to lock herself in this one room with our kids. And that's where the gun is. And he said, because that means that that person is coming for them, not coming for the house. And he, and, and he was like, and that's the only reason there's even one gun in my house. And he's like, I'm in my car. He's like, take the car if you want the car, whatever. And I was like, that's very sane to me. Don't you think? I was like, you know what? I think that's called common sense. <laughs> you know what that leads me to think of common sense gun reform. Don't you think? And we were, we really did have these, we, we met in the middle on so many things because we just never brought up the mayor of New Orleans who he was really against or the symbols or the, the brands, you know, Trump is a, brand that's actually existed in our minds for millennials our entire lives and for non-millennials at least half their lives. So there's so much to this team. It's like almost like yeah. rooting for your team that even when they're losing, you still just had been rooting for it for so long. And so I think that disassociating from the brands and talking about the issues is, is what I have found to be so effective. But, yeah. Um. And I think both of those stories are really good examples of what everybody can do. I think everybody has so much more power than they realize because particularly in the digital age, right? Like if you got 50 friends on Facebook or the Instagram or whatever we were saying back, so they're making fun of me for the way he I He called it social. the Instagram. I was <laughs> trying to. And I we were like, you can call and it. that's when he almost got his millennial card snatched, okay? I was like. And we were like, you can call it the gram. Like, first of all, we're not call even it really on Instagram. Facebook. I yeah. was trying to be funny. That one fell flat. I was unsuccessful. <laughs> so anyway, 
but these personal relationships we have, like we have a platform that is at least as big as our personal relationships on social media, and, and certainly as big as who we meet, who our family is, and when someone has is already in a relationship with you where you automatically have credibility, like they're your stepfather, like they've chosen to talk to you on a plane, yeah, it absolutely makes sense that you tell your story and you help people see how you got where you are. That, that's far more effective than TV ads. It's far more effective than anything else that happens in politics. It's like if, if, if everybody who uh, voted the way most of the people in this room do, uh, we're, talk, we're having these conversations, that would change the country. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I feel like this, we're going to start with you on this question, Jason. Okay. You'll know why after I've done right. it. <laughs> you can ask, having way too much fun. I think she's, she's going to ask you if you're going to run for president. <laughs> <laughs> you should. Yes, Cleo, actually, are you planning to run for president? One day. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's good. Ladies, that's how you answer if you're ever going to run for office. Yes. Okay, so how does a heterosexual, white, cis male, <laughs> I promise it's on the card. Are you sure use... this is for me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> keep going. I know. I'm, Best I'm use sure those too. privileges for change without perpetuating the cycle of the dominant class survivor. This is an excellent question. Thank you to whoever wrote this down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, th I think what you were saying earlier about uh, being very active and not just letting stuff pass by and saying, no, I'm actively going to stand up and say something. I'm actively going to involve people. I think that's a big part of it. And it reminds me of a story, actually, that um, a friend of mine told me. Uh, he, he was in the Army. Uh, you know, I, I was in for a little bit of the time of, of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, but for most of his career it was during. So it's a little tangent, but I think it's a good analogy to it. Ta tangents are fine for yeah. you. I'll he, let you know when I'm, I, when I'm done. Yeah, no, I have no <laughs> doubt. I'll be like, ah, okay. I have no doubt, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the story he told me was that when, if anybody would, would say something that was like an anti-gay slur mm -hmm. in his presence, and this was during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, he, as an army officer uh, who was a straight white male, he would say, just so you know, for the period of time while we're working together, you know, you're not allowed to ask me whether I'm gay, and I'm not supposed to tell you, but I would prefer, and he would say this to all his coworkers the first time somebody did this, he would say, I would prefer if you just assume that I am uh, in my presence. And, and, and that made a huge difference in the decorum in his unit, wh wherever he was. And I always just thought that was a really um, impressive way to approach that. And I think that there, you can kind of analogize that to the way to approach a lot of things, which is the second you hear anybody say anything that sounds that way, is it to say, is it to call them out, to call them a racist necessarily? No, it's to tell them that that bothers you even if you may not be the person that they're talking about, that, that you're offended by it and it hurts you. Absolutely. Yeah. And to be clear, the reason I gave you the question first was I think... I was kidding. I obviously gave <laughs> you the question first. No, no, but I think you have... I, in general, like, in general, everywhere you go, but I think that there are... that you are one of the people that, like, lives every single day, uh, lives out the issues that you, you talk about, the values um, that you say you believe. And, I mean, Justin, when we first started and you were like... Stephanie Shirak was just out here. We're talk we got like two really great women on the panel. You want me to go first? Like, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm gonna defer. Like, you are really good at checking yourself. And I think we should all think about um, how we, because it's, at some level, we all have a certain level of privilege. Mm -hmm. some, some, some people all have a certain level of privilege. Um, and so I think we should be thinking about how to check our privilege every single day without somebody having to check us on our privilege. Mm -hmm. so what, what thoughts, Cleo, thoughts? Well, I, <laughs> I also think that in this era of finding the imagination to create the new normal, it's, it's vital that we redefine masculinity. And I think that in order to do that, we need leaders who are ready to say like, you know what, that's not what being a man is. Right, that's great. Um, and, and so when I hear that question and, and I see the way you, you know, whether it was, there was something even backstage where you called something out and being like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if that's da da da. And I was like, that's Cool. He just, he he's was like, so he, woke. he didn't let that go because I thought it in my head. I was like, I'm not going to say anything. But I was like, yeah, he just said that. Cool. Um, and But I think that that has a lot to do with making sure that if there is going to be a boys club, it's one that respects, honors, and, and treasures those who go without the same privileges and, and, and as, as them. Yeah. Absolutely. But also, I just want to bust up all the boys clubs everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they should exist. But we're keeping the girls' club. But we're, oh, we're absolutely keeping the girls' club. So we've been marginalized. Yeah. <laughs> Bust up 
the boys clubs, keep the girls clubs. Yeah. Because we need them. I'm kidding. Actually, I just, I want to clarify. I want to, you know, I don't know. It might be somebody from Breitbart in the back talking about it. I'm going to be on a headline tomorrow. I also think it's important that we have, we do create spaces for our, our young men and whatnot too. <laughs> it's true. No, I really do believe yeah, this, that yeah. we do create spaces for our young men to be around other young men, and that will help break down um, and bust up the archaic idea of what is and is yeah. not masculinity. Yeah, and, and finally give us gender power dynamics that make sense. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, absolutely. But I still want somebody to open the door for me when I'm walking out. <laughs> I'm not letting it go. I want my door open. I'm gonna remember that on the way out of here. <laughs> <laughs> You listen. <laughs> How much more time do we have? I don't want to overstay our welcome here. OK, all right, all right. Um, Jason, how does being a veteran affect your political views, or does it? Uh, it absolutely does. How it, so? Well, it affects everything, everything about me. I mean, it's the most formative experience in my life. Um, as far as my political views, I actually, I think it's really related to the conversation about privilege. And, and, and here's how. Uh, First time I ever was on the receiving end of decisions by politicians that were bad decisions that negatively affected my life, I was in the back seat of a vehicle in Afghanistan in a vehicle that didn't have any armor. And I, I knew that there were decisions that were made, decisions that, yeah. you know, uh, put resources, for instance, in Iraq, not in Afghanistan. And I knew that there were political decisions along the way that created that situation. And the reason that that so influences my political views is because that's not a hard luck story. That's a story about somebody who was able to get all the way into their mid-20s before they experienced what it was like to be in the wake of politics. And, and that's what I've tried to remember. I mean, I grew up comfortably. Like, there was no politician that could make a decision that would take food off my family's table or anything like that. And, and I know that there are an awful lot of Americans for whom their first memories are that emotion of feeling let down by the people in charge. And I got to be in my mid-20s before I felt that. And so, for me, you know, I was already thinking about running for office and had taken steps in that direction, but when I came home, I understood it very differently. It was not a game, there were real stakes, and, and I'm very motivated to be in public service for those people who didn't get all the way into their mid-20s before they felt that way. Oh, that's mm. such a good story, I almost cried. <laughs> I did! Thank you. I also may be about to be on my period, but yeah. whatever. <laughs> But you have to hold back the tears till you get your lashes done. Tomorrow. Absolutely, because <laughs> once you get your lashes done, you can't have they can't get wet for 24 hours. <laughs> I feel like I need a whole podcast just about lashes. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I feel like I have to ask you: How does being an artist or a, a poet specifically affect your political views? Um, you know, I because you have some. I <laughs> I think it's more being a black woman that affects my political. Come on, career. black woman, one word. <laughs> Tell me about that. Tell me about this, um, please. Well, clearly not me. You know, for them. because <laughs> <laughs> I understand. This is for everybody else in um, the room. You know, having the fear systems I have that so many people can relate to, whether it's you know having a brother who's driving around Louisiana during you know the time Alton Sterling was murdered, whether it's um, knowing that the experience that my father has had throughout his life, and and knowing that you you instantly feel like members of your family, your cousins, your uncles, are not as safe as other people. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, and knowing the difference of how you and your friends get treated when you walk into rooms or airports. Or airports. Y'all know I got arrested mm -hmm. at the airport last week. I saw so many people go like this. It's, but you know, when you know, when you sit with a, your friend and you hear these things and, um, how does that not, um, yeah. you know, my, um, my, my friend, Dr. Tara A. Trent says that uh, uh, when people ask her, how do you decide what to get involved in? How do you decide what you want to speak out in? She says, just ask yourself what breaks your heart and get to work on that. Such and I think that for me, the black experience in this country has broken my heart time and time again throughout my entire life. And so that has always been, I feel, my starting place for what I choose to be involved in and, and active in. Um, and then I think because of that, it intersects with so many things, motherhood, I think that it, it, in, in, in uh, healthcare and reproductive rights. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Y'all can snap for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. And I think so. But are you doing okay after the airport? No, I don't. Like, tell the people. I, I am. I'm doing because you know I what? just. 
I I'm am. so outraged. When you talk to I'm, I'm mad too. I'm going to sue him. But yes, I, I think about, I, I thought about as I was, as I was handcuffed in the back of a police car. Um, so you what, you're going through airport security. Oh, I didn't even get through security. I was in the pre-check line, y'all. You're in. I was in the pre-check line and I had, uh, my bag was extended. You know how you can extend the soft bags? And he told me it was too big. But the people, before, like the TSA people told me it was too big, not the American Airlines folks, which is like, since when is TSA police in my bag? But whatever. Uh, they told me it was too big, and so I knew that I just needed to take my laptop out. My laptop was in a big case, and I was going to throw it in my, my purse. If anybody's ever seen me in the airport, I, I carry like a big-ass purse. <laughs> so I was just going to throw it in my purse. And they told me to get out of line. And I said, no. I just I went around the lady, and I was like, I'm not trying to miss this flight. And uh, a TSA agent came up to me and was like, you need to get out of line. I said, no, sir, I just need to take this laptop out, and I'm trying to get the laptop out the bag. And he says, you need to get out of line. I was like, you need to chill. I need to get the bag out. And he's like, security, we need the police. And I was just like... Lord, this ain't the first time the police were called on me at the airport, mind you, but this was the first time that I had been arrested at the airport. And when the police come, you know, they don't know anything except that they w the TSA people want me to get out of line. Um, so they tried to touch my stuff and it escalated. And I just, I just remember thinking there were two officers and then by the end of it, there were 10 officers. And I just remember thinking um, before they put me in handcuffs, they were, they were trying to touch me and I kept backing up and I was like, I don't feel safe. I'm, yeah, I'm screaming in the airport. I do not feel safe. I do not feel safe. Don't touch me. I do not feel safe. And in my head, I'm thinking, why do I feel the need to say that? Mm -hmm. And then as they threw me up against the wall outside the TSA pre-check line, put a knee in my back and put handcuffs on me, um, and as they were turning me around, the guy was kind of jerking me around and all I kept thinking, I kid you not, was don't let them put you on the ground because every time somebody gets on the ground, they die. Alton Sterling, Eric Garner, like, that's, like that, that was the thought that was going through my head. And um, so, you know, I went to jail, whatever. They let me out because I was like, I didn't But didn't those do are anything. the fear systems I'm talking These about. These are the fear systems I have, and I was re that I are was re so unique to the experience oh of God. being a like, black person in this country. I had to go back. I went back to Harvard that afternoon, right? So I'm like, I'm a Harvard fellow. I'm a CNN political commentator, and they're like, Yeah, we don't care. You don't have any rights. And I was like, You're being recorded. But I go back to Harvard. <laughs> I'm recording you. What the fuck? I go back. Pardon me. I go back to Harvard that evening, and. Um, I, I had to tell the people that I had been arrested because Fox News wrote a story and I had to email, literally. How humiliating is it for me? I'm the, I'm the youngest fellow that the Harvard Institute of Politics has ever had and now I'm a jailbird. <laughs> I was applauding the, you know, the whole thing, I don't know. Yeah. But it was, it, was, it was actually humiliating for me a little bit to have to email the executive director of the Institute of Politics and be like, hey Amy, got arrested at the airport today. Just want to let y'all know because the story is coming out. But I remember telling her the story the next day, and one of my good girlfriends was uh, at Harvard that day, and she was in my office, and she is an attorney, a, a career attorney for DOJ, and she was like, "This is my fear every time I go to the airport," and I'm like, "You shouldn't have to be afraid." And I was thinking every single time I walk out of a, a nice store with arm with with security at the door, I am praying that the alarm doesn't go off, mm. because I and and even though I have a receipt in my pocket in my purse, in my hand. I'm praying that the alarm doesn't go off. And I know that that is a, that is, that is a feeling that um, may, may, maybe like Jason can't understand. No. Um, and that's a no, feeling. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Like, the, yeah. it's, it's, th yeah. that's the point. And there are so many people living in this country that have fears like that every single day. And so I, I guess we, this is how we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, but when we talk about like being the change and the change we want to see and working towards change and how we have each in different ways dedicated our lives to doing the real work and using our platform to elevate the issues, I am constantly thinking about um, the folks that, 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 are, that are walking through the airports or that have that, that, that a little, their heart jumps a little bit when a police officer gets behind them in a police car as they're driving, uh, when, when someone asks them for their ID. And they ask them, do they belong here? I'm constantly thinking about those people um, and how we can make sure to elevate those folks and those stories. And am I, am I doing a good job at standing in the gap for other people? But also reminding myself that there is no level of notoriety um, or privilege that will, in fact, protect you if you are a person of color. Remember when country. Oprah got uh, No, and, and in Italy, it was the, Oprah. Folks, the folks was like, you can't come in here. She's like, I am Oprah. Like, <laughs> I am Oprah. <laughs> Like, She's no like, love. Oh, Oprah. Oprah. I got a magazine <laughs> with my face on it. Every month. Every month. Like, shout out to Oprah. She like, yeah. none of y'all is getting a magazine. <laughs>
Except Michelle Obama, I think she gave it, she gave it to her. I don't know. I, know. <laughs> I don't know. I think she liked Michelle, but it's Oprah's magazine. <laughs> <laughs> but no level of privilege or notoriety um, will necessarily like can protect a person of color in this country because the way that our laws and such what and such are set up, um, you can literally be killed at any time for anything, and it's it, it, and there's nothing folks can do about it. And while that may seem like daunting for some people, um, it, it, a daunting idea. I think that's a real opportunity, um, and it's a it's a it's a call. Like we have to get up every single day and work for change in all these areas because there are so many people that depend on change coming to this country. Mm. Like we deserve a better life, a better world, and I am proud that y'all are some people that's gonna help get it done. Yeah. Before we go. Cleo Ray, you wrote a book. Girl, what's your book about? It's called Heart Talk, Poetic Wisdom for a Better Life. <laughs> and I am going to be signing them somewhere. Somewhere, here in this building. I don't know where, but and, I will be and there. <laughs> they can get your book here. Can yes. they also get your book on Amazon? Yes, you can get it wherever books are sold. Oh my God, we can get it in the airport? I think you can get it in some airports. I'm going but, to get your book in the airport. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Shout out to the 92Y for having us today, okay? The 92nd Street Y is, the 92nd Street Y is one of these, like, it's, it's just such a place of history. Mm. And I am so honored that we could be here today to kick off their quote unquote young people series, mm. XYZ. Thanks for having me too. Well, you know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> With a special You didn't appearance. let me get to you. <laughs> I told them backstage, I was like, I think I'm the, I'm the RA. Honorary. <laughs> well, y'all, please give it up for the honorary millennial, the president <laughs> of Let America Vote, and a potential 2020 Democratic presidential contender, Jason Kander. And then again, please give it up for artist, author, soon it's going to be New York Times best-selling author, uh, activist, and everybody's favorite BFF, Cleo Wade. This has been amazing, and I think it's over. Bye, Give it up for Simone. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs>